All right. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, if you will, this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you wonder what I'm doing when I walk into there, that's where all the buttons get pushed to do the recording and everything. And that is my, uh, my son's not here this morning. And uh, so I uh, have, uh, <clears throat> so I'm the, the, the chicken on the hot plate, you know, got to get over there and dance and do, okay? So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, if you will, we've been looking the last couple weeks at the issue of the Lord's table. Uh, trying to do it from the viewpoint of what saith the Scripture. Uh, there's so much out there about it, yeas and nays and negatives. Uh, I, I, I was uh, reading, uh, by the way, you see the orange tie? You like that? Okay. You know why you wear orange on St. Patrick's Day? You're a Protestant. You're not a Catholic. Catholics wear green. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, St. Patrick, it's a free beer. Uh, uh, yeah, you. Uh, yeah, when you. Not anymore for you, brother. <laughs> hey, you never know what Joel's going to let you know about here. But uh, uh, they, the, the, in the, on the island there, there was a rebellion, and uh, Saint Patrick was. Uh, he, 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 he's used by the Roman Catholics to. Um, well, he, if you read his teachings, he taught Catholicism. But William of Orange was the Protestant king that uh, defeated the Catholic king, James II, and liberated the island. So you wear the orange is the Protestant color. If you, look at a, if you look at an Irish flag, you've got green, white, and orange. Green is the Catholics, orange is the Protestants, and white is the neutral ground in between the two of them. And uh, so anyway, so I wear mine in protest, Protestant, but not really. I just like the color. <laughs> I just like something different, you know. I almost had a black shirt on, but uh, then Linda's like, no, it's too black. And I'm like, yeah, but then I wear my pink tie and everything, you know, it looks sharp, you know. But uh, anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's do what we came to do this morning, and that's study. In Romans chapter number 4, verse number 3, the beginning of that verse, Paul asks a question, what saith the Scripture? And we've been looking at different topics throughout the, uh, really the year so far, about different things and just what the scriptures say. Tradition says a whole bunch of stuff. I, I was reading a, 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 a guy was, had written an article about why not to do the Lord's table, and he talks about the commandments of God and they give, were given to Israel and everything. And then I got to thinking, but wait a minute. Doesn't Paul say in 1 Corinthians 14, 37 that the words that I say unto you, they are the commandments of the Lord? Doesn't he say over to the Thessalonians, I've given you traditions and commandments? So, you know, so then I'm like, well, let's stick with what the book says. So we've been looking at it here. We, we started and just, I, told, I tried to show you two weeks ago what it's all about. And, and in 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 23, For I have received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. At the end of verse 25, in remembrance of me. The issue of the Lord's table, is a, it's, it's a memorial to, that you're doing in remembering him. The cup and the bread, the cup, the, the, his, his shedding of his blood, the justification. Those are symbols. Those are just, they're used to symbolize and to note and, and to look at some things and to see that, hey, by the way, hit the cup. Does that bring to mind something on the eve of Calvary where he's in the garden and he says, Father, if this cup will pass, hopefully next week we're going to start Easter's late this year. I couldn't get over how late it was. And we're going to spend, we're going to start next, next week looking at the many infallible proofs of Calvary and spend four or five weeks looking at that and, and, and things as, as we come to, to Easter. We celebrate the Lord's resurrection every day, folks. We don't need a day on a calendar to do that. And, and we're very clear in that. But it's critical to understand some of these things. When he says this cup, which is the blood of the New Testament, here's the blood, that New Testament. Paul later in 2 Corinthians says that we're the able ministers of the New Testament. And everybody gets their, they get all their, all worked up about that stuff. But when you understand that, how many times did the Lord die? 
just one time. But that one time, that once for all impacts both the nation of Israel as well as the church, the body of Christ. And when you under, begin to understand the impact, the cup, his blood, your justification, where he set you free from the marketplace of sin, where when you came and said, I trust you, you're my Savior, you're the one that sets me free. He says, yep, I did it, and his blood is what does it. In John 20, when we've been studying, we're going to see this as we look. The, they go around, and he, John says, he is already dead. No question about it. He died, shed his blood. Then the breaking of the bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, bread, substance, food. Yesterday morning we were at the men's fellowship. I tell you what, you missed the men's fellowship. You missed good breakfast. The teaching's okay, but the good breakfast. So we're sitting there and we're eating and we're doing the and it's like, oh man, look at but what we break bread, you eat, you get nourished. So the bread is a is a symbol of his body that he broke there as he hung, but it's for your life. Substance. So you have your justification. And then you have your sanctification, your walk in time, the life that he gives you, and then that living his life out through you. We saw that. Last week, we looked at the do's and the don'ts. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to take the bread and break it. You're going to take the cup and drink it. You're going to do this in remembrance of him. Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death to you. That's what we're going to do. That's what you're, you're to do. By the way, verse 23, you see how he starts there. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. People, I told you about the commandments, and other guy says, well, this is really Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's Israel. But who's Paul the apostle to? To us. The word comes to him. He gives it to us to go do what with it? Go do it. This isn't something a maybe, maybe not. Now, at Corinth, they were having some problems, and here's the don't. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty. Then you get down, and there's some damnation, and there's all this stuff, and everybody, oh, you're supposed to take a moment of silence and ask God to forgive you of your sins. He already forgave you of your sins. See? So that, all that religious poodly do stuff, don't do that. The unworthy here goes back up in the chapter, back, starts back up there at verse 17, where the Corinthians, when they came together, they came together, they had a meal together, they called it, we're doing the Lord's table. We, <laughs> I usually say potluck, and everybody goes, yeah. <laughs> they said Lord's table, you know what everybody went? Yeah. Problem was, is they were doing it unworthily. Some were eating, some were not. Some had T-bone steaks, other had Oscar Mayer wiener hot dogs. So you had this competition going on because you had divisions on, in the group. The group wasn't united. The group wasn't together. And what the Lord's table is all designed to do is to bring the, it's to be done in a local assembly, to be done together. And it's to be done as a memorial of him and the life that I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live for, and I focus in on what he's done for me. Not whether the Cubs won. They'll win. But not whether or not. Or if the bear, not any of the other stuff in life that we tend to talk about around the potluck table. But what does Christ mean to you and I? Now, the interesting thing, verse 26, by the way, we talked about that. This morning, I want to talk about with you about the conclusion that Paul never gave and kind of wrap this up with you with some things and some ideas and some thoughts for us. This is for us, folks. I know folks are on the Internet. I know they'll watch this on the YouTube, and you learn the doctrine, but this is for us to do together. How and what that looks like is for us to decide, okay? Jumping ahead, my buddy the fly, he's here. We'll get him. But look at verse 26. Notice it says, for when you do this every Sunday. It doesn't say that, does it? There's groups out there that every Sunday, you know what they do? 
They do communion. They do the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you see that for as often as? You regulate when you do it. And when you guys there at Corinth come together and do this, let's do it right. By the way, again, you have to remember, I started when we did this two weeks ago, this, we're jumping kind of in the middle of a context here about the use of your liberty in debatable areas, in areas that are just, they're there, we're to be doing them, we're to be operating, we're to be functioning in them, but there's some leeway in it. And when you get into that, and when you begin to see that the issue of using your liberty that we have in Christ, you can say, you know what, I just don't want to do it. And guess what? You don't have to do it. We haven't done the Lord's table in about six years here. I don't remember any time God striking any of us down dead with a bolt of lightning from heaven. Huh? Yeah, well, we're getting to that. <laughs> it's not called the Lord's table, though. They're getting together, calling it the Lord's table. Seminars potluck. That's different. I'm telling you, when we get into it, you're going to see this. The problem at Corinth, notice what he says. Look back up there, verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is his hunger, and another is drunken. What? And see, what they were doing was they were saying, we're doing this, we're going to call it the Lord's supper, getting together, and there was problems in it. There was no unity. When he says there, I know, back up, in verse 19, for ye, for there must be also heresies among you. Verse 18, there be divisions among you. There's no unity. See, this, this event is to be done when there's what? Unity. A oneness. A, a thinking process here. Okay? As often as you do it, there's no regulation on when you're going to do it. Okay? There's also no regulation on how it is to be done. If you look up with me at verse 33 and 34, this is where we left off last week. We'll read these two verses, and, and we'll talk about it. And Jim is right. We do do a potluck, and we end up fellowshipping around it, <laughs> okay? But we're, not call, we're calling it what? Potluck. We're not stopping. We're not paying. And, and Linda and I, we, I've had this conversation with her this whole past week about this. We fellowship around who we are in Christ all the time, okay? And so to say we're going to have a special deal, to me kind of goes, but we do it all the time. So then every day is a special deal. And, and I, I understand that's what Jim's getting at, but we don't call it what? The Lord's table. You follow that, okay? I'm trying to watch the faces, make sure you're catching on here. Verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. By the way, if you're thinking on others and you're not thinking about yourself, what do we begin to have? Unity. Philippi Philippians 2. And then, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together in, into condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. 12.1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. You see how he says that? And when the rest will I set in order when I come? What he set in order to be done at Corinth, at Corinth was never recorded in Scripture. He leaves the how open to us. When we come together to eat, obviously he sounds like he's talking about a meal to me, okay? Not an imitation meal, but rather a, a meal where the saints begin to put on display all that Calvary has accomplished for them in their life. So there's some things that are here. By the way, a table. I, I, you hear me keep calling it the Lord's table. Go back over in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 21. Paul is, I mean, again, folks, Paul's getting on the Corinthians because they're out of line. They're, they're misbehaving. He says, you cannot drink the cup of devil and the cup of... the." I'm sorry, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table 
and of the table of devils. You've got to figure this out. Where are you going to be? The table, a table in Scripture, represents a place of blessing. If you think about over in Revelation where they go, come back to Psalms 23. I just go back here, Psalms 23. Psalms 23. You think about in Revelation the, the, that, that the Israel and the little flock, they flee to the wilderness where there's a table prepared for them. Well, it's Psalms 23, 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. The, the, it, the thing there about a table, you prepared a table for me. Look over with me at Psalms 69. Psalms 69, verse number 22. Psalms 69 and verse 22, talking about Israel and her fall. And and notice why he says this, let their table become a snare before them. The many blessings that were given to the nation of Israel, that if they would obey the commandments, they would be blessed and they would bring in the, they would bring in one harvest, would lead right into a planting, would lead right into a harvest, and off and off. And 69, 22 of Psalms, you know what he says? Let their blessings, let their table be a snare to them. And that which should have been for their wel- welfare, let it become a trap. That's that issue in Romans 11 where Paul brings it up about them falling and moving away. Come over to Psalm 78. Psalms chapter 78 and verse 19. Psalm 78 and verse 19. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The answer is yes, he does for Israel. So when you come, come over to to, to, uh, uh, Matthew 14. So when you come and you talk about a table, you're talking about a place of blessing. You're talking about a place of benefit. You're talking about something that's going to happen where there's a, so there's a couple of things here. A, you need Matthew 14, did I tell you? I don't have the overhead today. Ricky's not here. Uh, when technology and I just don't get along, <laughs> unless it's explained to me 10 times and then written out on paper, <laughs> okay? Matthew 14. So there's a couple things here this morning to consider and to look at. A fellowship meal, a supper that's belonging, a, a, table, a, a meal belonging to the Lord, and then that issue of the bread and the cup, and in remembrance of Christ's work and our fellowship one with another in the Lord. Okay? The breaking of the bread. When Paul says he took the bread and broke it. Look at Matthew 14. And look at, with me, if you will, at verse 19. Now, he's feeding the 5,000 here, Okay? And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took five loaves and two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and to the disciples to the multitude. What did he do? He took the bread and he broke it. But what are they, what, what event are we, he's doing what with them? Feeding them. It's a meal. Look over at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. If, I, if you miss a verse, holler at me. We'll, we're going to have a conversation here in a minute, so just yell at me, okay? John 6, and look at verse number 11. John 6, 11. Same event, but just notice how John records it here. And, when Je- and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Notice it's a distribute. He breaks the bread, and then it gets distributed out. Okay? In other words, it's not a potluck where everybody's dishing out of all the different, uh, picking out of all the different dishes. It's a distribution done here. Come over to Luke chapter 24. Back to Luke 24. I just want you to get the flavor and the feel here. And then we're going to turn it upside down for you. Luke 24. Luke 24. Notice, if you will, uh, verse 30. Luke 24, 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. 
he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Now, notice what he did. He came, he's, they're sitting at meat. They're sitting at the meal. He takes the bread, he blesses it, and then he breaks it and distributes it. Verse 35. And they told, that, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. These guys are sitting, they're having a fellowship meal around some of the events that have just happened up in the chapter. And notice there's the breaking of bread associated with it. Break it, bless it, and then pass it out. Now, hold on to Luke here. Well, run over to Acts 2. I just kind of catch the thought here. Acts 2. So it seems that breaking bread really has a general reference to the issue of sharing a meal, having a meal common with each other, enjoying the the fellowship together, if you will. Now look at Acts 2. Acts 2, drop down to verse 42. Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Verse 46. And they, continu- and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They're doing, my point is they're doing it together, okay? Now, there's a lot going on here doctrinally. I'm not, I'm not trying to work. I want you to see the issue of breaking of bread and how it gets associated with having a fellowship meal around with each other. Now, come back there to, to Luke 22. Luke 22. This, in in Luke 22 here, again, you have this issue. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20. Luke 22, 19. And and again, this is is where he's he's being betrayed. Judas Iscariot in verse 3 is going to go betray him. Then they're preparing the Passover. They actually eat the Passover. Okay, you with me, Luke 22? All right. Verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. So he's breaking the bread and he's passing it out. Likewise, also the cup. Now, notice those next two words. After supper. Isn't that interesting? Well, bread and water isn't necessarily the meal that they just eat. What meal did they just eat? The Passover. So it seems Luke 19 happens where? In the beginning of the Passover meal. Then at the end of it, he then does verse 20. Takes the cup. This is the cup of is my New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Isn't that interesting how Luke records that? You know why? Because only us dumb thump Gentiles want to be religious people, zealots, break it out and make it into something more than it really was in the very beginning. You follow that? Religion has taken the simplicity that's in Christ and complicated it. They're having a meal together. The 11, the 12 are in the upper room. Judas is going to leave. There's going to be 11 of them sitting there. And you know what he says? At the beginning of the meal, we broke the bread, and I did that. Then he takes the cup after supper, after we're done eating the Passover, and then we drunk the cup. That's fascinating to me. Only we come along and say, well, no, it's got to be done this way, or don't do it at all. My point is, is it seems to me that the breaking of bread has to do with the meal. Okay? You got that. But what does Paul say? Come back to 1 Corinthians 11. You know what he says? When you do this, and you fly it under the moniker of the Lord's Supper, the communion, or the Lord's table, you're going to do it this way. 
You're going to have some bread. You're going to break bread. You're going to have a cup. You're going to have this, the symbolization of your justification and your sanctification. But you know what? How you guys desire to do that, how you decide to do it is up to you. It is not written in the canon of Scripture that we have to have. This is how old these are. I spent money, so I kept them. I didn't want the little lid. It's dirty. It hasn't been used in years. Sitting in the hall closet. You don't even know I had it. I got a box over there of a thousand little cups. You want to do this? Knock yourself out. You don't want to do this? Knock yourself out. But when you get together and you say, we're doing this for the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, buddy, you better be doing it in remembrance of who you are in Him and everything he's done for you. It's all of that. That's how serious this is. So much so that the whole chapter is written by Paul to the Corinthians to correct their bad behavior in doing this. Because they weren't in communion with one another. They weren't in unity. They were divided up. They were messed up. Verse 33, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-three. 33. Paul sets no procedures of how to do this, folks. That's my point. The conclusion that Paul never gave was that you have to do it by every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to pass the emblems around now. When I pulled these out a minute ago, setting them up up here, somebody went, "Uh uh-oh. Hey, there's no big table in front that says, this do in remembrance of me. We need one, by the way, but we don't have the room, so don't bring me one, okay? Why? Because everything we do is in what? In remembrance of him. You follow that? Obviously, you feel me trying to stress something here, don't you? So when it comes to what are we going to do? We, us, here. We have interlopers on the Internet. I know that, and I understand that. This event is to be done in a local assembly of setting. I look around the room, there's 70 something of us here, roughly. So, what do we do? How do we do this? The last time we did it was in the backyard, and we did some things and everything, and it worked fine. It was, you know, like I said, about five or six, seven years ago. And we had a catered meal. We had a meal come in. We did uh, Boston Market, actually, and they came in, set their stuff up. We had decided, the the leadership had decided back in the day that uh, there would be no work by the women, that that there would be no serving. You're on your own. The food is provided. We do a little work in setting tables and chairs up and overhead the shades to keep you out of the sun. And then we would sit as a family and we would have this meal together and have a time of fellowship around the meal, around who we were in Christ, not talking about sports or the weather or the car show yesterday (laughs) or this weekend or any of that, but talking about and focusing in on who we are in Christ. So I developed a little sheet about kind of directing that conversation at the table. Folks, we could do that. I know a good barbecue joint. We had them last November. That'd be good to do it, right? We could do that, or we don't have to do it. That's the wonderful thing in the mandate here. The mandate is to do it, but how you do it is up to us. You follow that? You're to do it. When you do it, you're doing it in remembrance of who you are in Christ. You're doing it in remembrance of, uh, of, of your justification, your sanctification, the whole ball of wax. There's no command to not do it. There's no command to do it, actually. It just says, for as often as you do this. Isn't that wonderful? We all come from different backgrounds, do we not? We all come from different different areas of our lives. We all have different religious backgrounds. When I pulled this stuff out, some of you Baptists got a little knee-jerk reaction of, woohoo, here we go. Some of you guys went, huh? If I walked out and stood down there and had a little chalice, I I have one at home, I should have brought it. Oh, I got it at the... Fair. I'm like, man, that would have been a good one, you know. And, and, and you would think about the religious, 
Some, of, some folks go, oh, no, I don't want to do that. What are we doing? Folks, grace says you can do it the way you want to do it, the way we want to do it. That's fantastic to me. That means it says if we, if we say, hey, let's not, let's not do a big meal. Let's just do something here in the room from time to time where we have an opportunity to sing some extra songs, to have a word of testimony of what the Lord means to you and I. We do it here together at family. It's usually called the Thanksgiving table if you grew up that way, where you went around the table giving thanks. We didn't. Food's on the table. Let's eat. Thank, thanks, Mom. Let's eat. Boom. You know, five hours to cook it, 20 minutes to kill it. You know, boom. Right? So, right? That's what it is. And then Mom would say, okay, boys, and do the dishes. I'm not feeling too good. Later, Mom. Yeah, 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 it doesn't work, right? Hey, folks, we could do that. We could have the meal. We could sit together, take a morning, have some study, and say, hey, let's rem-. The point is, is that it's open. Come over to Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2. You see, folks, the issue in doing everything, the issue in doing together, and, and again, I was talking to Linda about this, you know, because if you're going to cater something, you got to get ahead of time, you, got, you know, and you got, then you're looking at the, the budget money, and then you're doing, you know, and then it's like, all right. But then I got to thinking, we do this every Sunday we get together, where we fellowship around who we are in Christ. We just don't take the moment to stop and remember him. And what I mean by that, and I'm going to talk with the board about this, and then I'm going to send an email out to you guys. So if I don't have your email, you write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me. Put your first name, your last name, and your email address because I have to get your, we have to have input together. And sometimes the quickest way is through email to get, get feedback, okay? Because the thing is, is we're going to be doing this together. We can take the moment, we can take a morning, have, like I said, have a study, have a time to sing some other songs that we like to sing, and have a moment of testimony, a time where you just stand, read a passage. I understand you guys appreciate me and what we do here. It ain't about me. It's about who? Him. See that? Now, you can praise the Lord for a lot of things. I got that. But it's not about running around, serving, and doing, and da-da. It's just about stopping for the moment as a group and remembering him. Ministry gets very busy. <laughs> it gets very distracting. You get pulled. Linda, today, she asked me, she goes, do you have your meeting this afternoon, Saturday, Sunday afternoon? I said, no, I'm done with them. <laughs> They're on their own. She's like, oh, really? I said, yeah. I'm like, she's like, oh, are you sure? I said, unless I get a phone call and I got to go. Nope, they're good. Okay? Then some counseling and so forth. They're good. All right, good. good. I said, why? <laughs> What's going on? She goes, well, heck, well, we got a few things we need. I'm like, that's fine. We'll do it. But it gets to pull you. It gets, it gets busy. You got Monday night, Sunday night. Poor Marla, she, she's going four days, five days a week. Doing, you get busy. And you know what really quickly happens? Is you forget to stop and say thank you. Think about the bread for just a minute. Galatians 2, verse 20. The symbol of the life of Christ. Galatians 2, 20. Hangs on the back wall for a reason. One, so I can remember how to quote it right. But two, for you as you go out, you'll read over one that says, I'm complete in him, Colossians 2, 10. The other side, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet what? Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Boy, look at that. What breaking of bread there is right there. It's not I, it's who? It's Christ's life living in me. As we go day by day in our daily lives, it's his life living out. Friday, we went down and walked around the, the car show. I had never been to that car show specifically. A lot of walking. You see things and you do, but you know what? You're out there doing it as in who you are in Christ. You're enjoying some good-looking cars. So 
trucks and other things, but still, you're doing it as who you are in Christ. It's His life living out through us, the bread, Him. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 and verse 21. Folks, the conclusion that Paul gave was, hey, it's up to you guys. Every local assembly is independent. There's no mother church to go back to, to say what well, this our denominational home church says. We got to do it this way, so we got to do it this way. No, if we choose to stop and do it this way, we've chosen to stop and do it that way. If we choose to bring in Dickie's barbecue and have it all set back up, and we enjoy that meal together, then guess what we've chosen to do? That way. Now, if we choose to do that way, we're going to do some things different than we we didn't. Always learn from past, but that's okay. Philippians 1, verse 21, notice what Paul says. For to me, for to me, what was on Paul's mind? What was Paul's driving force? What should be our driving force as a local assembly? For us to live is what? Christ. For us, and I say that, I change the me to us because I'm talking about us. The life of Christ begins to live in us. And he's that bread of life. Over there in John 6, he talks about I am the bread. The bread of life. And as we begin to learn who he is to us, from our apostle, the apostle Paul, you know what we can say? For, me, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. For to me, for us, what are we going to do? We're going to live for Christ. See that? See the focus. And again, I talk about this all the time with you guys. Come over to, well, Romans 6. You get the point. Cup, the cup. I think you get the point. Did I, you said Romans 6, Rick? Go to get Romans 6, we'll get Colossians 1. You were right there by Colossians. Folks, the conclusion that Paul never gave is very clear to me that the matter of choices out there for us to how we're going to do this is spot on. And we can choose how we're going to do it. We do it. If another group says, how can you guys, can you do it like that way? It's none of their business. It's us here. Well, you know what? I I think you guys are just breaking, blah, 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 blah. You know know what? You go, you go, hit the road, Jack. Give them the old family feud X. You know? Why? Because it's here. We're here. Okay? Romans 6 Notice the cup, the symbol of his death, our justification. Romans 6, verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. That issue of baptism there, don't ever put water in this passage. You just kill it. Baptism is the issue of identification, and I, we are identified. By Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist looks at those guys, the Pharisees and the hypocrites and the vipers, and, the vi- and he says, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming behind me after me, that he's going to get you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So baptism doesn't always mean water. It means identification. And you and I, because of Calvary, And because of chapter 4, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Because of chapter 4 and verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Because he died and because you trusted his death. You know what he says? We have an identification there of the code, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, so that we can have a newness of life and go live and let Christ live in us. And what that gives us, Colossians 1, verse 14, is tremendous security. 
of understanding in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So when we come together and we do whatever we decide to do, it isn't a time of confession of sins. The confessional is closed. Actually, we don't even have one. We don't even have a baptismal. If you're demanding to be baptized, we've got to fill the, the, to- the, the bath to- toilet. <laughs> okay, that was a slip. <laughs> we'll have to fill the bathtub up over in the, in the hall bathroom. That, I was thinking bathroom, you know. <laughs> okay, why? It's, it's a spirit baptism. Because we have, because we trusted Christ, because he, has, he is our justification, and because He is our life, all right, the forgiveness of sins is a mute issue. It's done. It's been taken care of. So then what do we do? How should we proceed? How should we partake of the Lord's table? Well, I've laid out a couple options to you this morning already. We can have a meal. I'm all for it. We can sit. We can break bread. We're going to do it. We're going to, there's, if, if that's what we decide to do, then there's going to be some guidelines and rules and stuff and how it's going to be done that I'm going to establish. Okay? Or we can do it in here. We can sit in here together as a group, have a time, just take a, a morning and just spend the time. The point is, is, or we can just say, you know what, let's just not do anything right now. We've been doing good. We've been okay. And that's fine too. What's the scripture say? I gave it to you to do. And as often as you do it, just make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Remembering him. Okay? Now I think about our state of the assembly at the end of January. That was a business meeting that we moved up into the morning. We can do something very similar to that and call it the Lord's table. The Lord's the table, I told you, is that place of, of uh, benefits and blessings for Israel in the wilderness. There's no greater benefit and blessing than to hear the testimony of others as we sit in a room like this. Or to have someone stand and just read a passage of Scripture that meant something to them, reminded them of who they are in Christ, and it meant something. You don't have to stand, you can sit, okay? You don't have to come up to the front in the microphone. Or you can just sit and, not, and just sit. It's okay. But you have that oneness that begins to come together as who we are in Christ. If you have another suggestion, come over to 1 Corinthians 1. We'll close here. Then you need to let me know. Let us know. That's why I'm going to send an email out, okay? Kind of do a little survey. Folks, I am not hard and fast. It's one way or the other. Or we do it, like I said, we've been six, five, six, seven years since we've done it. Like I said, God hadn't struck any of us down dead for not doing it, okay, right? <laughs> but look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Again, we can mix it up. We can do different things, as long as we're doing it for the right reason. Follow that? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your Son for everything that you've blessed us with, with all the spiritual blessings, with the completeness, the all-sufficiency, the all-equipping is because of who we are in your Son. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, James.